this is going to be a little bit of a change of pace compared to the last few talks because I, I, I'm kind of a new convert to MSK ultrasound. First of all, though, I'd be rude if I didn't welcome everybody to Texas. The, uh, I, I told Scott that if we have the course next year, that everyone's going to have to bring their own water. So uh, that might be hard to bring on an airplane. So uh, I'm going to talk about radio, radiologic evaluation of wrist and hand with an emphasis on MR and ultrasound. And ultrasound imaging starts early. First thing you have to do is confirm that there is a wrist. And then, uh, and now some people are demanding 3D imaging of their uh, of their babies, and you know we we haven't we haven't quite put in a 601 package for that yet. So, you know, I I'm a little skeptical of ultrasound, and 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 when I came here, you know, I used to always tell Scott. Scott would say, "Hey, there's an ultrasound," and I'd be like, "An ultrasound? Are you kidding me? It's like it's like going to a museum with a flashlight." And you know you really need need an imagination. You know you can either see a face or you can see a ghost, depending on on, on kind of really what you want to see by ultrasound. And I, I told you know this is a very long talk, and you know I just wanted to put it all in the syllabus for completeness' sake. But I'm just going to hit on some of the highlights here in the next 20 minutes, and I'm going to just compare and contrast MRI with ultrasound and explain why I'm I'm becoming a little bit more of a believer in the merits of ultrasound as I as I go on. Now, MR, as you know, is probably the closest thing we can do to a to a uh, autopsy to see everything in the wrist. There's less operator dependent, less radiologist time, and there's more RVUs per hour. Now, now, as you know, the radiology community is business is becoming much more competitive, and the amount of reimbursement is going down. You know, not only the uh, technical fee, but the professional fees are probably going to be going down. So. Anybody in their right mind would rather read about seven MRs in an hour than do one ultrasound in an hour, just for just for the financial benefit. Uh, and an MRI is also is often needed because of poor clinical acumen and multiple causes of pain. So I don't want to malign any any referring physicians, but but a lot of times it'll just say pain or it'll say you know mechanical symptoms. It won't even narrow it down as to ulnar sided or, or radial sided pain. It won't talk about whether the pain is activity related or arrest or anything like that. Oftentimes there'll be a mass and there won't even be any mass described in the history. So by by necessity we often have to do an MRI just to figure out what's going on because we wouldn't even know what to look for by ultrasound. One of the uh, one of the um, uh, the um, advantages of ultrasound is, of course, it's a real time exam that can show you functional anatomy. Uh, it's you know you can't really beat putting an ultrasound on somebody's tendon and saying, okay, flex your finger, extend your finger, turn your wrist, you know, pronate your wrist, supinate your wrist. There's all kind of things you can do in real time. It's very quick in the proper setting. It can help the orthopedic surgeon decide whether or not to take somebody to the OR or not right from their clinic, and they really like that. It's good customer service. It's good for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, you can do RA uh, screens without contrast, but in general we do MRI with contrast. So ultrasound is a way to track the treatment and progression of RA without any type of contrast. It's very useful. Uh, it facilitates interdepartmental cooperation, and you can intervene and treat if necessary, like Lance and some others have showed. When, once you have the ultrasound on the patient, it's not that much of a greater step to just treat them, treat their symptoms. Uh, and then, of course, there's a lot of patients where MRI is contraindicated. And then the, another advantage of ultrasound, which uh, which I like, is you can delete whatever you don't want or know what it is. So you you can you can you can submit an examination with one or two images and say, hey, that's the that's the ganglion, that's the mass, and you can get rid of all the other stuff if you want. So let, let's talk about ultrasound in the ideal setting. To me, an ideal setting is when you get a direct referral from the orthopedic or rheumatology department. So you're sitting there in your in your MSK reading room, an orthopod or rheumatologist comes over and says, hey, I got this patient. This is where they hurt. This is exactly what I want to know. Can you ultrasound and tell me? And it could be anything from, is the tendon torn? Is the tendon disrupted? Do they have an infectious or inflammatory tenosynovitis? How's their rheumatoid arthritis doing. It's very, it's very 
uh, ideal in that situation. And it's also nice if the clinician comes along and is actually like standing there while you do the ultrasound because then you could say, hey, is this, is this what you wanted to know? Is there anything else you want to know? Does this answer your, your clinical question? And then, as I mentioned earlier, the patient participates in the exam by showing, you know, where it hurts, if there's a mass, by pointing to it, saying if it's solid, if it feels like it's cystic, um, does, it, does it enlarge during the day, you know, and all that type of stuff. And a lot of times, if, if you have a knife injury or something like that, you can, you can put right over the, uh, the laceration and you can see if they've done any damage to any tendons or if maybe the laceration entered the joint or anything like that. And it's a lot quicker than waiting for an MR. I mean, we're, we're pretty flexible in getting a ASAP or a, a, a stat, uh, you know, MR in, but, but like Lance said, in some places it's it's 40-day wait for a routine MRI, and that's just too long for a lot, of, a lot of things. The results should have a tangible impact on the patient's treatment and, and disposition. So you shouldn't just do an ultrasound and then put the report up and then like six weeks later some clinician gets a report because in my opinion, you could have just done an MR in that amount of time and just put, put a report together. So it should have a tangible impact. Does the joint need aspirated? Does the tendon sheath need aspirated? Does, do they need treated? Do they need to go, go to the OR right now? And is there anything emergent or urgent going on? Another thing I've seen is the patient, the radiologist, and, and the clinician, if they're there, can show the patient exactly what's wrong and they can decide how to treat it. I, I've actually seen... Um, you know, orthopedic surgeons get informed consent from the patient after a knife wound or something like that right on the spot. So we're, do, we're doing the ultrasound. There's a little laceration on the finger that they can't move their finger. We show that the tendon's torn or that the, the laceration may have entered their joint. The orthopedic surgeon says, hey, I need to take you to surgery right now. The, the, the patient sees the images. That, that is really what I call informed consent because they, they talk about the risks and benefits. The patient really knows what's going on, and they just knock out the consent right there and schedule them for the OR later that day. And then, like I mentioned earlier, this could decrease the use of gadolidium like an RA evaluation if you're using uh, power Doppler and stuff like that. And, and, and ideally, you're going to have a decreased wait time for diagnosis over MR. Now, I want to talk about wrist forearm ultrasound in the non-ideal setting. Now, if your department is understaffed, ultrasound can really put a strain on it. You know, if you're the only person reading bone that day and then somebody comes by and wants a, an ultrasound that takes you an hour to do, you know, then, then you're, you're an hour behind and you're just going to stay later or you're going to leave stuff for the next person. So department understaffing can put a real strain on the ability to do ultrasound. Uh, referring providers are often inexperienced and cannot narrow down the diagnosis. It's not usually, it's not often the provider's fault. Oftentimes the patient doesn't know where they hurt. They, they, uh, patients, you know, they, they're, they're not always the, the best historians in the world trying to tell you, the provider, where they hurt. So sometimes it's a fishing expedition and you, you really don't want to do an ultrasound for a fishing expedition. The other thing is if a referring provider cannot or will not take the patient to the OR, why you know why do the exam? Why should you tell them if the tendon's torn when, if the ten even if the tendon's torn, they can't take them to the OR that day anyway, or or they have to send them, or they have to call somebody else, and then there's a longer waiting period. So you really want them to be able to act on the ultrasound results as you find them, and then oftentimes the patient's not counseled by the referring provider, making the radiologist. Uh, the you know not not only the radiologist but making us the orthopedic surgeon, rheumatologist, physical therapist, occupational therapist, and primary care physician. I, I don't know how many times I've ultrasound somebody's wrist and it, and I've figured that they have a ganglion, and then they ask me how they're going to treat it and what the recurrence rate is and what the complications are, and and usually I just tell them that I prefer the King James version over the international version and leave it at that. But that often leaves me and the patient with a bad taste in their mouth. So you can kind of get put in a bad spot when you're doing ultrasound in, in the dark where they just send the patient over for an ultrasound. You can spend a lot of time talking to patients while that list is building up, and it can be very frustrating. I also don't really believe in routinely scheduled ultrasounds. I, I believe an ultrasound should kind of be a walk-in procedure where they come, they, somebody finds you, somebody calls you and they send them over.
and then you do the ultrasound and answer the question and go back to work. Now I will say though that you can't really get good at ultrasound unless you do ultrasound. Now we do plenty of routinely scheduled ultrasounds and it really is good for practice and training purposes. Oftentimes, you know, we get a lot of MR correlation. You know, it'll be a fishing expedition. We don't find much. Then we do the MR and then we look back at the ultrasound and see if there's something we missed or something we could do better. So you, you almost have to do some routinely scheduled ultrasounds to get good at them. But in general, it kind of defeats the whole purpose of an ultrasound. So I didn't really want to turn this into an MRI versus ultrasound talk. You know, because because in many ways it's Goliath versus David, Fukushima versus Three Mile Island, Apollo versus Rocky. I mean, you there you know, MR MR like I said can show you everything. Ultrasound, you really have to know what you're looking for to make it useful. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to talk too much about the protocols, but I just want to emphasize that that MR can be an uncomfortable procedure for somebody to get. You know, this is a much more comfortable way to image their wrist at the side, but then again, you run in the field in inhomogeneity in, in problems, poor fat saturation sometimes at the edge. And so we really try to put everybody into the Superman position if possible. Um, but then again, that's a very uncomfortable position. And a lot of patients that have a wrist MR, they'll come back and report to you that they never want to have one again because it tore up their shoulder, it hurt their back. You know, 45 minutes sometimes to do, to sit in that position can be very uncomfortable. And I, I want to thank Dr. DeWitt, by the way, for uh, posing. For you. <laughs> so, I don't want to, I'm not going to really, you know, insult anybody's intelligence. Obviously, if you're looking for a fracture, ultrasound is not the examination to do. You know, plain film, CT, MRI are going to be much better. I really haven't found ultrasound to be all that great for ligaments with a few caveats that I'll show you later. But if you really want to see the intrinsic ligaments, including the TFC, in particular if you want to see any of the extrinsic ligaments, which are hard to see even on MR, you're going to need an MR. So I'm going to just skip through some of these things relatively quick, uh, quickly. You know, ultrasound and MR both have 3D and multi-planar capabilities, which we've discussed. So not a real advantage there. Not a real advantage there. One of the um, pitfalls of, um, of MR that I want to show you is, um, let me skip, skip ahead right here. No, we'll get to it later. There's a lot of, of orthopedic surgeons that are starting to buy low field magnets and put, in, put them in their office. Rheumatologists are also doing the same thing. And those are gen, those can be, you know, 0.7 T. I've even seen some patients with as low as 0.2 Tesla, which is not more than just a, uh, just a household magnet. And, and they're pretty good. I mean, I, I must say that that does eliminate problems with patient discomfort because they're usually just sitting down in a chair with their wrist either supine or prone and you can very comfortably image the patient. It's certainly not as good as, it, as the 1.5 or 3T Tesla imaging that we're doing you know, at our institutions. But, but it, it is becoming a very good competitor to, um, to, to standard MR and it, it is eliminating some of the discomfort problems in some of the, uh, you know, the, the contraindications to, uh, to MR that we usually encounter. So this is a, sort, of, sort of an up and coming thing and I think we're all going to have to face the fact and get used to start reading some low field uh, magnet uh, images. I think that's kind of the future. The um, one thing I want to say about low field magnet imaging and ultrasound is if you see a mass that looks like a fluid filled mass on a low field magnet, if it's in a very characteristic location like along the dorsal aspect of the scaphalunate ligament where a ganglion typically results, I can pretty comfortably say, yeah, that's a fluid signal intensity mass, probably a ganglion, and leave it at that. If I see masses anywhere else in the hand and the wrist, I, 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 you really need to bring those people back either for an ultrasound or a contrast enhanced study. These low field magnets are not very useful for contrast. You get very poor fat saturation and it's really a waste of time to give them contrast. So this is one case where an ultrasound can definitely be complementary to, uh, to MR. And I just want to say that I used to think in terms of MR versus ultrasound and I think that's a wrong way to think. I think that MR and ultrasound are very complementary and we'll, we'll get to some of that uh, 
coming up. This is really what you want to look at when you're looking at the wrist. Everything from the osseous structures to the TFCC, intrinsic and intrinsic ligaments, tendons, things like the Guillain's canal, the carpal tunnel, and then all the way down to arthritis if they have it. These are things that you can see very well with MR and you can answer all 10 of those questions uh, with MR. Some of them are not going to be very answerable by ultrasound and we'll kind of skip through these very well. Obviously fractures you're not really going to see them too well with MR. I mean with uh, ultrasound you're going to need to go with plain film CT and MR. Fixa you know, Post-operative fixation you're going to have to go with the MR. Anything that has to do with Kindbox disease avascular necrosis, abnormal alignment, ulnar abutment syndrome. I haven't really found any of these things to be all that useful with ultrasound. Even the TFC, if I get a history for rule out TFCC tear, I really just divert them over to, to uh, MR. You can try an ultrasound, and I think the more we do, the better we're going to get in looking at this. But I just really wouldn't feel comfortable sending somebody to surgery for a TFC tear based on ultrasound. So these are a lot of things that, that we're either going to have to get better at at ultrasound or, you know, we're just going to have to say, sorry, you know, an ultrasound just not indicated. Let's just go right to the MR. Now, as far as the scaphalunate ligaments, we have tried to image people with masses along the wrist. And very oftentimes you can find a ganglion coming off of the dorsal aspect of the wrist. And you can actually find the neck right in between the scaphoid and the lunate. And a lot of people are thinking now, and it actually makes common sense, that there's probably a little bit of tearing in the scaphalunate ligament to give you a ganglion. It may not be clinically significant. It may not cause any malalignment or instability, but there's got to be some kind of tear to give you that ganglion. So even though we're not the greatest at seeing the scaphalunate ligament and whatnot, if you see things like ganglion, you can often surmise that there's at least a partial tear or an abnormality in the scaphalunate ligament. So this is your typical ganglion with its neck coming right out between the scaphoid and the lunate. Again, you know, you'd want to put color on there to make sure that it's not a solid mass, which is one of the real beauties of ultrasound. And it's just going to be a typical ganglion. And they may just have complained of wrist pain, or they may actually be able to point right to that mass and say, this is what's bothering me. And then you're done. You have a ganglion there. And then like, like Lance was showing earlier, you could actually go in there with a needle and you could try to drain it. You could try to put some sclerosing agent in there and maybe it won't come back. But ultimately they may have to, they may have to have surgery to fix the scaphalunate ligament tear. But you could probably do some preliminary treatment on that with ultrasound while you're there. Carpal instabilities, again, plain film, CT, and MR are going to be your, your bread and butter for carpal instabilities. Okay. Um, one of the pitfalls with MR when you're looking for carpal instabilities is oftentimes when you put somebody in the pro Superman position, you're going to pronate, you're going to pronate their wrist and you're going to give them a false, you know, owner positive or owner negative variant. So that's something to take into consideration when you're doing. Uh, MR. Now one thing I just want to get to in the last five minutes is the tendons. The tendons on MR are obviously exquisitely seen. Here's a, just a diagram of the extensor compartment and flexor compartment. And a little ch way to cheat is to start on the radial side in the first dorsal compartment and go longus brevis, longus brevis, Lister's tubercle, longus brevis. And that's your dorsal compartments. And then your, then your flexor compartments are going to be down here. And we used to have an MSK radiologist that used to tell me that, that I should always carry two things in my wallet. One of them was a diagram of the flexor and extensor tendons of the wrist. I won't get into the other thing. But that actually makes it a lot easier to read these things out. Read, read your MR, pull out your little diagram. It doesn't matter how many of these you do. Make sure you, you mention the right ligaments on your exam. But, you know, you really have to know your MR anatomy before you know your ultrasound anatomy because once you start getting in there with a hockey stick, which we'll see on the cadavers, you're going to need to know whether you're on the ulnar side of the wrist, the radial side of the wrist, volar or dorsal side of the wrist, where you are in respect to Lister's tubercle, and that's where you'll decide which tendon is, in addition to making them move their fingers and stuff like that. But you're going to want to have this type of diagram with you or in the back of your mind before you make a diagnosis by ultrasound. 
The ultrasound, we'll see these a lot better on uh, in the cadaveric studies, but you know, everybody is used to seeing tenosynovitis on MR with or without tendon tearing or tendinosis, just fluid surrounding the tendon sheath. You can obviously see that very well by um, ultrasound. Let me just show you a couple of ultrasound images here, since after all this is an ultrasound course. Here's normal extensor tendons. You can make them look either intact or not intact, depending on your plane of imaging. So we'll see that in the cadaver, where you can actually make the images look at normal if you angle the probe in a certain way, and then you can make them look normal if you angle them in a certain way. So that's that's your typical normal extensor tendons. This is tenosynovitis, so you have your tendons in the middle of a of the uh, fl a fluid collection, so infectious or inflammatory tenosynovitis. Again, the advantage of ultrasound, you can stick a needle right in there if you want. You can drop some fluid to see if it's infected or not. And then you can have your answer right there. By MR, it's often too late. You know, the person's already gone. you got to call somebody and bring them back. Here's decurvain's tenosynovitis. The only way you'd know that is this is the radial aspect of the wrist in the first dorsal compartment area, showing the first dorsal compartment tendons with a little fluid around. And they hurt right there, so that's a nice advantage. Uh, sometimes on MR, you go correlate with decurvain's tenosynovitis by ultrasound. You know they have decurvain's tenosynovitis because they're pointing right to the spot. There's a ganglion and the flexor tendon sheath. Again, the one advantage of doing this, you put color, you put color flow on there. You can tell if it's a solid or cystic mass. You don't need GAD. If I was doing this on a 0.2 or a 0.7 orthopedic uh, surgeon, you know, in 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 um, office MR, you'd often just be guessing. You'd say, I don't know if that's a flex, you know, a giant cell tumor of the flexor tendon sheath or a ganglion. They're going to need an ultrasound or they're going to need GAD. At least by ultrasound, you know that it's a fluid and it's a GAD. Tendon ruptures are very good. It's a real time exam, but this is sort of a balled up tendon right here. But you're going to want to scan longitudinally and find the discontinuity. And then you can make them, you can make them move their fingers and, and tell you if that's. So they can, sometimes it's partially torn and you can see this thing move in real time. Sometimes if it's completely torn and they, they can't move a finger and you could say, yeah, here's the edge of the tendon right there. You'll put a little mark on it for the orthopedic surgeon and the orthopedic surgeon will take them to the OR and that's, that's where they'll enter and they'll do the operation, you know, relatively quickly. Carpal tunnel in Guillain's canal. Ultrasound can still be very good for looking for solid or cystic masses in the carpal tunnel. Very good for identifying arteries and veins. I haven't found very much use in the diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome by ultrasound except excluding a mass. Let's talk about a couple of masses before we close. Here's a fibrolipomatous hamartoma of the median nerve seen by, seen by um, MR. Here's a big ganglion in the carpal tunnel seen by MR. And of course ultrasound is going to be very good. Let me just skip ahead to a couple of ultrasound images here. It's going to be very good for determining whether something's solid or cystic. Let's just skip ahead here in the interest of time. Again, all this—I I, I, this talk is a little bit longer than it should be, but all these things are in your in your syllabus for completeness' sake. So here's again again another ganglion coming right out between the scaphoid and the lunate. This is one where we really couldn't find a neck on, but it's just presumed to be coming out of that area. Patient reported a mass, and then you could confidently say that's just a ganglion. Another ganglion, no flow on color imaging. No flow, another ganglion cyst. And then let me just say a couple things about arthritis. I know this isn't, I don't think we have any rheumatologists here. Um, but let me skip right ahead to uh, arthritis. Arthritis is is um, not sure. I, I, I'll, be, I'll have to skip ahead on that one. Here's just a solid mass in the forearm. Again, you put color flow on there, and you can determine whether it's a solid or cystic mass. Barry Greer is going to get into this stuff, and let me just say a few words here by ultrasound. Ultrasound, of course, is plain film is going to be the mainstay of it. 
and we do a lot of MRs with, contra uh, with contrast to look at uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And then here's what it looks like by ultrasound. A lot of rheumatologists have ultrasound machines in their office, and they'll start to pick those initially diagnose the patient sometimes with plain film or MR and then they'll do a baseline ultrasound and then they'll start them on their DMARD and then they'll have them come back in three months and six months and they'll put an ultrasound probe on there and they'll just determine how much panis there is, how much synovitis there is and how much blood flow there is and they can actually put a couple of these images in the chart and they can actually follow them by ultrasound instead of following them by plain film and MR. It's a lot cheaper, it's a lot more convenient for the patient, and then you don't run into the problems of continuous gadolidium after gadolidium after gadolidium when these people come in. Again, just another example of rheumatoid arthritis. And then miscellaneous, of course, it's still pretty good for things like an abscess, phlegmon, foreign body. Here's a wood toothpick on MR and you can also see that very good by ultrasound. Wood is very echogenic so you can actually see the foreign body by ultrasound and then you can actually go in there and try to remove it particularly if your orthopedic surgeon or somebody is right there looking at the images with you. So just showing you that a solid mass versus a cystic mass. Very very intense blood flow by um, power doppler. So, so it was sort of a quick whirlwind tour but I hope that was useful to you and a lot of this stuff we'll see more in the cadaveric lab when we talk about different tendons and stuff. Okay, thank you.